Welcome, everyone, to Straight Talk Live. Very excited for our show today around Game Over for Globalization. Let's find out. My name is Rick Snyder. I am one of your co-hosts. I am the author of Decisive Intuition, and I am the CEO of Invisible Edge, where we develop intuitive intelligence for leaders and teams, specifically in the areas of decision-making, innovation, and sales. And I'm joined with you today by my co-host, co-partner in crime, and co-creator, Af Malhotra. Af, do you want to say a little bit about you and what has you excited about today? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Namaste. Namaste. It's very important for us to say namaste. Um, thank you for, for yet another show. Very excited once again to have a fabulous uh, guest on our show, Arun Kumar, who we'll talk about in a second. Uh, as you guys know, I'm a co-creator of StraightTalk.Live and also the co-founder of Growth Enabler. Um, and, you know, I've been so, so thrilled over the last few months that we've managed to create this excellent collective and experience with such great people. So feeling really blessed and uh, really excited about this conversation with Oren, uh, who's, a, who's a fabulous personality on, on many fronts, not just business, but also art and poetry. So let's crack on, Rick, and uh, let's start the conversation. Yes. And just to remind everyone about Straight Talk Live, Really, what this show is about is around human transformation, digital transformation, and social impact. And as we all know, all three of those have been incredibly influenced over the last several months in the changes around the whole world, where no country has been left unaffected by uh, the pandemic, uh, social unrest. So many hot topics are happening right now that are really having us re-explore and re-question uh, our global relationships and connections, and where do we need to put more emphasis on localization? And then where is that actually not enough? And we actually do need global technologies that can help us interconnect with what's happening around the world, because viruses don't know boundaries in, in the same way. And so how do we need to adapt in, the, in this current times? And so because of that, I am very excited to introduce to you our special guest today, Arun Kumar. And Arun is the chairman and CEO of KPMG India. He's a business leader and financial expert with several years of experience in senior executive roles and as a board and audit committee member. He's a senior commercial diplomat with expertise in advocating for policies and opportunities internationally. And most recently, he served as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Global Markets and the Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service in the Obama administration. So he has incredible experience in the worlds of politics, finances, business, uh, former Silicon Valley entrepreneur, alumni of Sloan School of Management, MIT, and finally, a member of advisory councils at Stanford University and University of California, Santa Cruz, and he also writes amazing poetry. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Arun Kumar. Arun, welcome to Straight Talk Live. Okay, thank you, Rick. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Great to have you here. And we want to just dive right in and pull on your expertise. Let's just start with, uh, what are you seeing right now in Mumbai? Obviously, it's been a few months now after the pandemic. KPMG is intimately connected with so many businesses. So you really have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in so many different ways. I'd love to just start there. What are you seeing in, from, where you're, from where you're located here in Mumbai? Yeah, so like every other country in the world, uh, India is hit. By the pandemic. Uh, we have been, I have been locked down for almost four months now. At KPMG we were actually one of the first firms to decide to have our folks work from home because we felt that uh, to ask the safety and well-being of our people come first. So very early in the game we, we made arrangements for people to work from home. KPMG is a whole in India, we've, we've got about 25,000 people and very quickly they were all transitioned to working from home, with some exceptions. Our folks who work with the government, our folks who work with banks and in certain other areas where uh, things were actually open, they would go, they would be a client side. But otherwise, mostly working from home. Now, the amazing thing is that things have worked quite well. Mm. So despite the fact that everyone's working from home, um, the amount of work that's been done has been significant, uh, almost um, to the same level as this time last year when there was no pandemic, hmm. which is an amazing fact. I mean, really amazing. Who would have thought? Uh, however, that doesn't um, mean that's easy. Uh, it's, 
it, it's hard, the, it's a new way of working. It's very intense. Uh, mean working from home means actually less spare time, not more spare time. Mm-hmm. So you all get scheduled in meetings, uh, and you know you don't know the difference between Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They all seem to to merge together, which actually is a challenge. We need to address that. We can't go on like this. We need to make sure that we put some boundaries around um, our own timings, timings of our people. But that's what's been happening. I've been. Um, I don't think I felt out of touch with the world, I'm very much in touch with the world. In fact, today happens to be my wife's birthday, and we had a Zoom party with friends in California this morning, and a Zoom party with my 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 sons and their families on the East Coast late last night. So in a strange way, we are connected, we are seeing each other, but not physically, but we're probably seeing each other more than we would uh, be seeing each other in normal times, because you don't get on video calls most of the time. Mm. Uh, you know, so it's, it's interesting how at one level, there's more connection, and at the other level, there's more distance. Mm. Uh, it's also not easy to travel because uh, the airlines are not back up uh, with some exceptions. So things are difficult in some ways, and uh, in some ways, connectivity is increased. So it's a mix of, mix of uh, isolation and the opposite. Mm. Mm. It, it's it's interesting because if you think of you talked about a really important point which is quite fascinating on the one hand we're doing this right now and we're in three continents you know you're in mumbai uh rick's in san diego i am in london united kingdom and we're, we're in three continents and we we we're chatting we're socializing we're cross-pollinating uh, we're learning from each other and in a way, weird sort of way, this, this is what you would describe um, or you'd imagine globalization to be, where people from different parts of the world have found a reason to talk to one another. Uh, it could be a debate, it could be a discussion, it could be trade, it could be investment, it could be innovation. But we're still doing it, which now brings me to the other point. Um, this, this show was about looking at particularly this heated, hot, very sensitive because of what's going on in the world right now, um, topic around globalization, or as the economist calls it, right or wrong, slowbalization. Mm-hmm. Now, what is, you know, I think what's fascinating about your history is that you've had the um, entrepreneur story, you've had the enterprise story, and then you've had the, the story in government uh, in the US. When you combine all of those experiences, trade relations, you know, the way the world works in its own peculiar ways, the way trade works or doesn't sometimes, and then you look at where the world is today, uh, tell us a little bit about and more your personal view on what is your intuitive self telling you? What's going to happen to the model of globalization as we knew it? Not, a, not four months ago, because I do think that globalization has been taking some body blows for a long time after the crash in the financial crash and then of course the sino-american tensions which has now been exacerbated i don't want to talk about that necessarily but as you probably know and seen you know the americans have said to the chinese shut that consulate down in houston and that's caused a huge amount of tension um so give us your personal view on what do you think is going on now? And what do you think may happen? Um, you know, it's not gospel, but your personal view would be very valuable. And then maybe your leadership perspective as the CEO of a very large company, uh, whether it might be the same thing, who knows, but uh, I'd really appreciate that. So I think uh, after you talked about the fact that there was a lot going on before the, the current health crisis, before the pandemic. Right. So you had the global financial crisis, which actually tested in some sense, the global system. And uh, as uh, you know, as, as has been reported, at that point, the Vice Premier of China spoke to the Treasury Secretary of the United States and said, you know, we had great confidence in this global system, but now what is going on? So that was it, the first test. And then, of course, we've had various other tests. Brexit was a very important one in 20, oh, yeah. um, uh, 2016 or thereabouts. That was a big one. And then you had the election of President Trump, uh, the talk about building a wall, et cetera, et cetera, pulling down the TPP, 
on his very first day in office. So essentially the whole movement towards globalization, the WTO, lowering barriers, all that was like reset mm. uh, a few times, every, every few years, further reset backwards. So that's been going on. Mm. Now, connected to that or not, there was a slowing in the global economy, global trade and in global growth for the last couple of years. Now, part of that could have been catalyzed by the US-China trade dispute. But nevertheless, there is no question that there's been a second decline in global growth as a whole for the last two or three years. As some countries have been growing. I mean, India has been growing. China has been growing, but at a slower rate than before. The US has actually begun to pick up growth, but the overall picture was not one of robust growth. All that was happening. And then we have the coronavirus. The coronavirus has brought in some new areas, some new tests. One of the big tests has been the concentration of manufacturing that was occurring in one country. Mm -hmm. and according to WTO, uh, 22% of global manufacturing is happening in China. So global supply chains uh, had a huge concentration in China. So if you have an epidemic that closes off a country, regardless of anything to do with trade policy or anything, uh, that is a hit on global supply chains. Right. Suddenly rang alarm bells about uh, having to think about uh, resilience, uh, redundancy, and so forth. But in, in a way, before the coronavirus crisis hit, the US-China trade dispute also began to have people thinking about diversifying so that they don't get hit, hit by tariffs or new barriers. Mm. So already there was a movement to diversify. Many manufacturers had begun moving to places like Vietnam and Bangladesh and some to India as well. So that had begun, but the coronavirus um, essentially showed that there could be other reasons why you need to diversify beyond just trade issues. Right. It's all sad. So I think on one hand, we've had a steady fracture of global unity in trade, mm -hmm. uh, which has now got a little bit of hit additional hit with the coronavirus. Um, but however, the coronavirus thing has told us some other things. It's told us that that we can be connected more globally. So as I said, uh, physically we might be apart, like what we're doing now. There's a lot more global connection. So while Zoom had like 20 million users in January, they have 200 million people using it now. Mm -hmm. right. right. The whole speed of globalization, people say, like a decade of digitalization, digital globalization has occurred in four months. Right. So it's something connected. So it's connected more casually. Um, where in the past we would wait for a visit to have a conversation. Uh, now you do a, a team's call and talk with people around the world mm -hmm. all the time. So in that sense, you've got these two things happening. Yeah. More conversations, more connections. Uh, on the one hand, and physical issues of movement and supply chains, etc. On the other. So overall, I think it's a mixed picture. But my own sense is that we'll come out of it eventually with a more globally integrated system. Why? Because economics dictates that. I mean, the whole law of comparative advantages that um, it makes sense to have countries specialize in what they're good at and benefit from each other's specialization. Mm. I don't think that's going to go away. There will be some, uh, there will be some understanding that a black swan event can occur, like occurred now, and therefore you may need to have some extra strategic reserves or some extra capacity somewhere else, have some redundancy in supply chains. I think all that's gonna happen. Mm. The overall my opinion is that once we go with this, we will get back on a track because that's that makes that's good for economics. Exports is really important to many, many countries, including the United States, in China, mm. India, because exports creates markets larger than the domestic market, which means that you can employ more people mm. uh, to things and services for consumers elsewhere. So it's important for employment, economic growth. Exports is very important for economic growth and employment. Mm. Uh, so everything is mm. in having more exports, having more trade. So mm. I'm an optimist. I don't think you can stop the, uh, the growth, the trend of increasing globalization. It could take a pause right now. Mm. So at the moment it's paused, but um, we'll pick up. You know, that's... You, oh. Sorry, go on. Go on right. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point there that I, I agree with you that I think the train has left the station for globalization and I don't see us going back. It's just, 
it's we're too integrated we're too dependent on each other already interdependent on each other already in many ways mm. for trade for you know gdp all these kinds of things I, I don't see how it could go back and you know i think the pandemic has also exposed where there's some real tensions where there are some um supply chain breakdowns where re- we're realizing as you said wow all of our medicine is made in china and then what do we do when we can't get that mm. and we're in a very vulnerable place for example in the us in that way and there's many examples of this and so this tension around the more we are moving toward globalization a lot there's also a movement to dig in our heels around localization and regionalization and nationalism even as well and we're mm-hmm. seeing that on the rise also so well, how do you make sense of that um where where does localization regionalization play a role in a global world because i still think that that's going to be incredibly important with physicality food resources etc cetera, etc cetera. how do you see that relationship moving forward well, i think i think both localization and regionalization have have major roles to play especially when they're aided by technology so for example with uh, robotics and and you know you can actually supplant a lot of labor mm. so if you went out for labor costs you could bring them back home or near home you know we back to detroit maybe to mexico mm-hmm. so you could have find a way of um, a balance there merging technology with the labor costs mm. so i think that 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 is an argument for localization and regionalization then the other arguments for localization to cater to local tastes etc so i think there will be a role for localization and regionalization because that's one way to uh, to hedge one's bets to have mm. that redundancy in that resilience so i would certainly expect to see see more of that mm-hmm. happening that that should be that would have good economic logic to do that but it's also down to the dependency i mean if you i heard in one of the the webinars i think it was yours on kpmg where there was this piece around supply chain dependency where the ppp uh, the ppe equipment or the gowns or the textile material for the for the medical gowns was coming out of Wuhan and of course everything stopped and it's quite a bizarre experience where if i'm a consumer let's go back to i'm a citizen of a country and my well-being or my health and my safety is governed by a supplier in another country who decides to shut shop you know where am i left so there's a sense of vulnerability that nations have almost put themselves into by being solely dependent on one country china being the global supplier for just about everyone out there funny enough there was uh, someone a friend of mine in india when recently prime minister modi announced that 88 apps will be shut down the chinese apps which is fine there will be loads of reasons for it and that that's a slightly different discussion but uh, this uh, particular person said to me oh um um you know uh, that's it uh, you know or you 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 need to follow you need to follow suit and i said well firstly i'm in london but i don't really need to he said well i'm that's it i you know i no more china stuff for me i said well you might as well throw your sofa out your television that mobile phone of yours and everything else that goes with it so i think um i think that is the situation we're in i speak from the uk standpoint i think one of the challenges we're facing and I love your input here aron the us has is a similar story but at a much larger scale but one of the challenges we're facing in the united kingdom is that a lot of the manufacturing the biotech side of our world we've either shut down slowed down um outsourced to other countries a long long while back and now wanting to bring that back home which is not impossible it is possible to do over a decade or so but there's one piece around skills and employment which keeps kind of bugging us where the the average person says this is all great at a very macro level af arun rick but actually what about jobs you know i i've been trained in one way of doing something are you say, and i'm 40 say i'm 45 or 47 not saying older people can't change but i'm a, i've been doing this for a long time as opposed to a younger person who's new to the industry or their career what do you expect me to do um if if you're creating new jobs and new opportunities um what is the responsibility of the government so i mean it's interesting because india is in a very different space but i'd love your view on um because you're running a large organization with a lot of people you know, high volume of people and and very smart people in india how do you look at this in two ways one is what would you say to a government leader um around managing the next decade around employment and skills 
that's the first piece. The second is a KPMG and how you're doing it at KPMG, how you're planning ahead um, to help your people become more upskilled and grow and thrive. So there are many, many parts to sure. uh, the various uh, issues you just raised. First, I want to say is that we also should not overreact to this concentration. So yes, PPE uh, equipment is being made in China, but frankly, you can quickly make it somewhere else and the world is doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that we've got to be a bit mindful mm -hmm. that we don't go overboard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it may not even be about whether it's in one country, you know, it's a large country, you can make it in some other city in that country. So if you're a corporation sourcing things, you need to make sure that you have redundancy within a country across the world. I, I just feel that to move to a point saying that we have to make everything that is strategic, it may not be necessarily the right answer. Right. Maybe other countries that could supply to. So mm. I would just call it against overreacting to this. Because you see, the world has reacted today in a good way. And these things are being made in many, many countries now. Uh, so that's the first thing that I would say. Second, I, I, I'd say that there are some areas where I think it's important for research and development to be a key part of uh, any country's strategy. Right in all the years, mm. the Western countries have downplayed research and development, especially the pre-commercial research and development. Now China, on the other hand, is now being to invest heavily in artificial intelligence and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the internet, where did that come from? It came from government-funded technology. Mm -hmm. DARPA. A, a lot of the technologies we use today all came originally out of US government investments. I think there's a role for governments, whether it's the US, UK, India, any country, to spend a certain amount of money on that advanced research and development that uh, will provide the products and services of the future, which leads to the skills question. Mm -hmm. The real issue of skills is how do you have the skills of the future? Mm -hmm. Skills are going to change over our lifetime. Things are going to change so fast that we need to learn new skills. So how do we, how do we have the skills of the future? And I actually think it needs to start with thinking about investing deeply in research and development, mm -hmm. creating that culture of innovation coming from research and development, research and becoming products and so on and so forth. Mm. So one thing I really say is that thinking deeply about research and development and the ecosystem around research and development is, is really important. Uh, and, and that's worked well in so many countries, wherever they've done it, wherever countries have done that, it's worked out. But in terms of skills, I think it's really a question of um, having the ability to work with industry. I think government has to work with industry to understand what are the skills that industry needs. Right. Uh, it's changing so rapidly. It's got to be a lot more industry, academia, uh, collaboration in, in, in developing the new skills that are needed. Mm. Uh, and frankly, in terms of what we are doing at KPMG, we are very big on learning and development. Mm -hmm. uh, our business is one of of taking advantage of disruptions and changes that occur. So if we need to, we need to be ahead of the curve in knowing about those disruptions and how they change lives, mm. or change business. So we are very invested in, um, in learning and development all the time. Mm. Mm. I have a related question to that, or when you're talking about upskilling and getting ready for the future, let's, let's focus a little bit more on leadership in particular um, we had this great uh, guest uh, a few, several episodes ago, uh, Lisa Dion, who talks about how when there's chaos or crisis, a whole team or a whole atmosphere will look to the leader to regulate their own nervous system. So if a leader's nervous system is calm, cool, collected, that's going to impact everybody else. But if the leader is frenetic, coming from overwhelm and stress and chaos, then that's going to also bleed into the team and the company culture as well. And then everyone's going to look for somewhere else to ground and regulate themselves. One of the things I get about you right away is how calm your demeanor is naturally. You, you naturally have this grounded calm about you and also a warmth that I feel too. It's not cool. It's warm. Mm. And so I want to ask you about that. A, how did you do that? How did you develop that, Harun? And then second part to the question is, what do you recommend to other leaders and what are the up-level skills they need to be developing right now? What are the ones that this world is now showing us 
maybe the leader from 30 years ago of command and control and whatever ways we did leadership 30, 40 years ago, what's being asked for now from leaders today? The first thing is, um, you know, I think every leader has to have his or her own authentic style. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very different. There can be people who are completely the opposite of my style who can be extremely successful. So I think there are different ways. I mean, each, each one uh, has to have, you have your own personal style, who you are. If, yeah. you, if you can use who you are uh, in your style of leadership, I think that works. Try to be somebody whom you're not. Uh, it's going to be phony. It's not going to work. Uh, so you have to find what is in you, I think, that's authentic. Mm. That uh, works. And that you can do that naturally, I think. So that's my sense about leadership style. But what is important, I think, is that leaders have to provide energy, whatever mm. form it is. It could be a quiet form, but you know that there is strength and that there's energy coming from that. Or it could be a flamboyant approach. But whatever it is, uh, it's important for a leader to pump energy into the system. Mm. There are so many things going on that suck energy out of the system. When you're sitting in a room and you can't get out, can't go for a walk or do shopping, that's not a very energizing situation. But that's when I think it's important to, uh, to find ways to A, be energized yourself because you can't, but secondly, to, to make sure that you translate. But I think no matter what style I think it's important that leaders provide energy into the system. I think that's really important. Uh, clearly, then you see confidence, so calm might be an, an aspect of confidence, but you can have people who are frantic, but still confident, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the other side. But mm -hmm. the, the more than calmness is good, I think, at least for me it's good, but uh, it, not, it may not, not be necessary for everybody, but I think the confidence is really quite important. I think people need to know that that the, the leaders, not just me, all, all my colleagues, the leaders of the firm, right. thinking about issues and applying their minds to it, and have the confidence they will work our, work our way out of situations as best as anybody can. I mean, no, there's no guarantee uh, in the world, but we know that, uh, you know, it's like in wartime, I mean, a leader in wartime, the troops have confidence that this person is going to help us win the war, but they do know it's a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. He's not in full control, but they will follow him. So that confidence is, I think, really important, however however it is conveyed. So mm -hmm. if I would boil it down, I think, uh, providing energy. See, a, a, a tired leader is a miserably tired firm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You think about it. A tired yeah. general, the army would lose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think but again, it, sorry, sorry, I'm saying just, just touching on the point you just made. I think you talked about this inject injection of energy, and it it doesn't always have to be jumping up and down and you know mm -hmm. high fives. Energy can yeah. and security and confidence can come in so many different ways. But it also boils down to our own uh, listening abilities, not just as a leader, but even your workforce has the, needs to have the ability to intuit, which is what Rick talks a lot about, the intuition uh, capability. And that can only be tapped into when there's less noise around you or less pandemonium around you. So I just want to reverse that for a moment because it's such an important topic. This crisis has um, sometimes brought the best out of people. And in other situations, it's brought out the worst in people and personal and or professional. You know, uh, the worst side is domestic problems people have got at home because of the circumstances you, you highlighted earlier on, where many of us are overworking, not underworking, because uh, we are on 24 seven. It's quite an interesting one and needs to be managed. And then there are some very positive stories around how people have stepped up and built mental resilience, you know, dusted themselves off, built, built mental resilience, become a little bit more emotionally aware and try to practice that emotional intelligence in real life situations. Uh, what, what would you, um, what would you say to, you know, the the youngsters? I don't know how to put it. I don't want to, to label them as Gen Z and millennials and Gen Y. The younger folk out there who are the next generation of leaders. 
um, what what their personalities are different. Their grooming is different. I mean, yeah, I was you know I was intrigued by your story. It caught my attention when you talked about your early career where you worked for Ratan Tata, who is an inspiring leader, and you're a young recruit and you made some sort of a four par an error or whatever, and you thought, oh my god, this guy's going to fire the heck out of me. But in fact, he said, I I can trust you to be honest, and so that quality of leadership instills faith, trust confidence you learn from those leaders so you know um unfortunately there is a vacuum of great leaders in the world we know that uh, if we were all great leaders the world would be in a different place and you need that yin and yang what would you say to the young folk who are entering this new reality um who might become leaders now or many years down the line either professionally or personally some people are leaders at home you know there's turmoil at home someone's passed away unfortunately you have to step up and that is leadership in its in its own way. But what what are your messages? I mean, you have a family as well, of course. What what is the guidance that you would give to these younger people who are thinking about my future? What am I, what's going to happen to me? What's my employment status like? Um, what, what's the what are those personal words you want to share with them? So let me come to that, but pick up on something you said a bit earlier. Sure, it's about listening. Uh, I think listening is a really important aspect uh, of important for leaders and for people building their career, like the young people are talking about. I, I think listening is incredibly important, but list, to be a good listener, one also has to have some humility, mm -hmm. because if you think you know the answers, you're not going to listen. You're going to listen to, to, to say, to show what you know, as opposed to understanding what Rick knows or Af knows. So I think listening and more and more in the world that we live in today, which is much less hierarchical, where young people, whatever generation you call them, they come out quite confident and actually knowing a lot more than previous generations knew at their age. Right. Their technical confidence, their knowledge, far surpasses what, you know, I, I, you know, certainly I knew at that age. So they, they come with that. Uh, and I think it's important for them to, to, to really listen to have the humility to learn from others. So I think that's a really important one. And you mentioned Mr. Tata, and he is that way. He is essentially a humble person. And I think that's one of his uh, outstanding qualities. Mm. Uh, so, but for young people today, I think the world is wide open. It's mm. going to be a challenging world uh, for, for the next few years, probably. But uh, with, with new technologies, new opportunities, with the fact that it's going to be a global world again, uh, I think uh, you know the world hasn't seen this kind of prosperity for, for many hundreds of years, and I don't think it's going to stop now. Hmm. But we need to, however, to be careful about some some topics like inequality. One of the things I'm really worried about is that with this crisis, will inequality be exacerbated? Right. So mm -hmm. If governments and societies and businesses don't attend to the topic of inequality, then our young people are going to to see the brunt of it because we'll have a less happy world. But generally, I'm a big optimist uh, for the next, for the coming generations. Just have to look past this year. This year is a tough year, but, mm -hmm. this, but look forward. And... Let me ask you this. Um, uh, if we go back to social impact and geography for a moment, um, how do you see the the winds uh, blowing the sandcastles around around our geography these days? Where, you know, a lot of times we see people now more uh, feeling more allegiance to their company they work for. If it's like a, one of the tech titans, for example, where they feel more taken care of immediately around visa issues or getting immediate support for their family or travel um, in an emergency, where the government would take a lot longer in, in many ways to act or help out uh, uh, some of those employees, for example, uh, versus citizens. What are you seeing as far as geography in terms of technology? Um, just in terms of how everything is moving so fast now, um, how do you see that shifting our allegiances and our identifications? Uh, I'd love for you to speak on that. I think on companies, the sense that most people have is that the old allegiances of staying with one company forever is going away mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. The economy changing, the, the, the gig approach to working is coming up. And now with COVID, there'll be no, we can work remotely. We don't have to go to this big city and work in those big headquarters. We can work somewhere else. 
So I think that the allegiance to companies might actually fray, which is a challenge for organizations. So why, what do organizations need to do to capture and keep that allegiance? And I think that goes back to having a higher purpose, having a culture that holds people, you know, a culture where people say, well, this is, the, this is the place where I'm happy. This is a place that the whose values I am in sync so I think the importance of culture and values is going to only increase. Uh, and that's the reason why people go to work in some place. Eventually in a free market, you know, people get paid more or less the same, so the same kind of work. So it's not, that's not the differentiator. So it's a very short term differentiator. The longer term it's going to be the culture. Is it a place where people feel they can grow and learn and they don't need to look elsewhere. So I think the, the, the onus is on companies and not on the people. It's companies to make sure that they create the culture and they create the environment and they create resources for people to really grow, succeed and feel they're doing something that is meaningful. And that's the whole idea of a higher purpose. That is really, really important. <laughs> I think it's important for all of us. We wouldn't want to be what we're doing, do what we're doing, just for the sake of earning a livelihood. So I think that's important. What countries, you know, my, my sense is that it's a long time since there have been any major wars. I mean, wars have, you know, often promoted uh, kind of strong national feelings. The world was moving to a place where there have been fewer and fewer wars. There's more comfort with uh, you know, global interchange. And I think that's going to come back. I mean, I don't think, uh, personally, I'd be surprised if the world had a, a bad sense to get into a major war. I think, you know, I think that those days are over. I think there are enough systems and people to be able to work things out. So, so the idea of loyalty to a country will be an emotional loyalty, but not necessarily a, a nationalistic loyalty, if you might. It could be an emotional loyalty because that's where you grew up, that's where your family is, that's the country that's done a lot for you. You want to feel you give something back in return as opposed to, you know, this is my border and by God, I know. That's my, maybe I'm, I'm an optimist here. There yeah, will I, always be some real politics. There will, I mean, also, I don't want to underestimate the role of some real politics. There will be some countries, whenever there's power, people are testing each other. So we will see the testing. The question is, how will the testing be resolved? Mm -hmm. Will it be resolved through to violent wars or will it be resolved uh, peacefully? My yeah. sense is that. Mm. I wanted to touch on, um, and by the way, for those who are listening in on um, the various social media channels and on Zoom, because we have a ton who've signed in through Facebook and other channels, feel free to ask us questions. We've got Denise, who's monitoring the questions, um, and we'll, we'll more than happily share them with Arun. So as they come in, Arun, I had a question specifically around, of course, the, the country that you're based in right now, which is India. And, um, and it's, a, it's, you know, it's, of course, a huge land with immense opportunity and uh, there are a lot of interesting things going on in India right now. Uh, some slightly worrying things with China and other things that are very, we're very hopeful about, like Startup India, um, the, the young people and their talent, uh, the drive for change in the country. And it's a big, 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 big nation with a lot of uh, incredible people and opportunities. Um, where, where do you see, uh, let's talk, you can talk about it at India at large, or you can focus specifically on KPMG if you wish. So wh where do you see uh, India's uh, biggest competitive advantage coming from the next five years? What can India do as a nation to cement itself and put a stake in the ground? Uh, let's not talk about what um, the political aspects, let's imagine it's going really well and everything's everything's falling into place. Why, why are you hopeful for India? Why are you so um, bullish on India? Because I guess you are in India as a leader running KPMG. So I'd love your view on that, please. I think that the talent of um, India's people uh, and the aspirations of India's people. So we've got a tremendous amount of talent and a tremendous amount of aspirations. And aspirations provide a lot of energy. Mm. People aspire, they want to accomplish, they want to, at every level, you know, it may be somebody at the, who doesn't have a great income, but people are trying to build for their future. They want to build a, buy a little flat in Bombay or a little house in wherever they are. But there is a feeling that they can get there. They see others getting there. 
So in, in, since in the last 20 years or so, the tremendous upward movement in India into the, into the, into the middle, lower middle class and the middle class, tremendous. I mean, the reduction in poverty in India is one of the big stories of the last century, second half of the last century. It's an enormous story. People in the West simply don't understand the magnitude of change that occurred here. And that change has really occurred in the last 30 years, literally in the last 30 years. That is enormous. I mean, China had a similar change. In China, I think since about 1976, they started about 12 or 15 years before India did. But they had an even more dramatic change. So that is a big change. And I think that this is just the beginning. So if you think about what you see in China today, for 20 years from now, that's what you're going to see in India. So in Mumbai, Mumbai will be like Shanghai, mm. 15 or 20 years from now. It's already on a path to get there. Mm. That is the change they're saying. It is inexorable change. It's going to happen. Uh, mm. And that's, that is what is so attractive about India. Politically, I think India has um, got a very strong democratic system. I think, uh, and this is why I, I don't worry about a big war with anybody, because I think that we have leadership that can deal with complicated issues um, in, in a sensible way. And that is really because of a very strongly built democratic system you know, that we can all be confident about. Mm. Mm. And, and I guess technology goes without saying is kind of the, the cornerstone um, that um, has, has given a lot of young people in India the opportunity to dream and to aspire and to succeed. Technology and a fair amount of reforms that are happening. Mm -hmm. So for example, 1990, there was a big 1991 or so, the opening of the Indian economy was a very big reform, mm. right? Allowing more foreign direct investment to come in is a big reform. Just over the last two or three weeks, we had Google and Facebook make enormous investments here. Mm. Mm. These are all big reforms that lead to jobs, lead to an upward dynamic in the economy. Most recently, uh, the agricultural marketing was re was uh, essentially reformed in a very big way, which means that farmers can make more money, they can more entrepreneurship mm. uh, in the rural and agricultural sector. That again mm. is, can be a very big reform. So, mm. so the so combination of technology and reform, uh, I'd say, are, um, are very important elements. Having an open economy, in the Indian economy, uh, had, uh, had finally with the introduction of the goods and services tax, even right. though that had any new reform, some teething uh, issues, but finally you have one common market in India. Sh products can go from one place to another without having to stop to pay taxes in multiple jurisdictions. Right. So you've got common market, freedom of uh, movement of goods. It's made it uh, more, uh, more efficient, more productive. So all these things come together, mm. but there's more to be done. Mm. Mm. The, 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 the dynamic of growth is unstoppable mm. in, in India. Let me ask you this along those lines around, I'm really getting your sense of optimism and your ability to see opportunities uh, where others might not. And that's really, I think the hallmark of a great leader is how do you tra transform crisis or chaos into opportunity? and challenge from, to, to uh, something that um, you can create from and innovate from. So along those lines, even though that's true, and where are you concerned? Where are you concerned right now when you look at the landscape, when you look at certain sectors, when you look at the real hardships that are happening right now? We're, even like if we just talk about small business and how small business is getting decimated from a lot of places that I see here in the US especially, and maybe globally too, um, what, where are your red flags and concerns right now? Well, the first red flag is uh, the slowing of demand. That's a big, mm -hmm. because if, you, if demand slows, then production slows, employment slows, it becomes a difficult cycle. So that is a very big red flag. And I think that might be the biggest red flag right now. Mm -hmm. uh, second, I think, is uh, the employment situation. Because of that, you've got much larger unemployment. Because of the disease, and social distancing, etc. We've got another set of drivers for unemployment. So unemployment, uh, especially at the lower income levels, is, is a very big problem. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a, a huge problem, and that can 
know, that exacerbates inequalities. It can make, it can make it a very, you know, when will that flip to a dangerous situation? I think that is um, something that one must be careful about. I think various measures are being taken in, in terms of income transfers, but modestly, and food transfers, etc. So that I think is one area. If I were to look a little bit beyond that, I think the real answer is going to come from education and skilling. People at every level have to have better skilling and better education. That will be better jobs, better value creation. And the third area I worry about, especially in the context of the pandemic, is the healthcare system. Mm. Would be, this would be a very good time to really invest in expanding the healthcare system all the way from healthcare delivery to healthcare to med- medical education. Mm. All of that um, would be a, a prime area to, uh, to invest in. Mm. So demand, employment or unemployment and the uh, education and all, obviously yeah, health as well. healthcare. Yeah, and and um, I'm conscious because we're coming close to the the end of the hour. And um, feel free to ask questions, guys. I have two sort of more personal questions. Um, one is um, related to the fact that you spent a number of years working in the United States. Um, I don't know what the the denomination is. If it was more in the U.S. and less in India, or about the same, don't know. You can tell us. Um, how did it? How do you and your family? I guess your your kids are out in the states. But how did you guys settle back into India when you came back um, recently? When you got, I, mean, I guess, a couple of years back. What, what's you know, Rick and I talk about. We come from two different backgrounds. We've coined this term, chutzpah masala. So um, what, he'll describe what chutzpah means and, and masala. You know what that means. I'm the masala. He's the chutzpah. Or together we're chutzpah masala. And there's this sort of unexplainable energy or vibe in a place right anywhere in the world and india is known to have its own special energy and vibe what has it meant for you to come from many years of working in uh, government of course in the us and then shifting over to mumbai um does has it changed your perspective has it opened your eyes to certain things that you took for granted has your family set up benefited from it what what's been your chutzpah masala what's been your wow inspiration because there've got to be many moments of that no doubt but i'd love to hear that um first and there's a one more question at the end yeah so uh, and i spent um, 39 years in the us wow, uh, two years wow. In washington, three years in um, in washington dc and most of the time i was in california and i must say i enjoyed each one of them in different ways i really you know really had a great time in, in all three cities and in India, this is my, I, I worked in India for five years about before I left the US. And now I've been back for three and a half years. So if you look at my working experience, I've worked in the US something like five times as long as I worked in India. Mm-hmm. So my work and experience is very much there. And luckily in Silicon Valley, which is just such an exciting place, yeah. you know, innovation. And then Washington DC working in the Obama administration, it was another tremendous experience. And there I had, fortunately, had a very global role, traveling to some 40 countries, engaging with so many different governments. So, you know, we're all great. And then in India now, I'm here, and it's a very different experience. What's exciting about India is what I just talked about, the fact that this is a country uh, and the firm that I lead is full of talent. I mean, a lot of energy, a lot of talent. Uh, sheer brights in terms of ways to do things. So the quality of people I work with uh, is just extremely inspiring. And not just the senior people, the junior people, I mean, everybody. Mm. People are full of ideas, full of energy, full of aspiration in a very, very good way. Mm. So that, that definitely is uh, it's never a dull day in terms of, of the energy you get uh, mm. from such, such smart people. So mm-hmm. that's what, and that actually represents the country too. As I said, India is full of people with talent and aspiration. Mm-hmm. Talent can be different forms. Uh, it, it may be, it doesn't have to be technical talent. It could just be people doing very ordinary jobs, but they want to do it well and they want to get ahead because they want to get ahead. Uh, they, they try to do, I mean, in Bombay, you find people, you know, 
people who work at your home might be working at three other homes and actually putting together a fairly nice income. Mm. So that's, they have that drive to get ahead. Mm. I find that extremely valuable. And the mm. drive to get ahead leads to them taking care of their children, making sure their children get good education. Uh, so that next generation is going to be at a different level. Overall, very positive direction here. Yeah. Beautiful. And my final one, and then Rick, you, you, you can wrap things up, mate, uh, relates to regulating yourself. And I, you know, I, I love the fact that you're an artist and you're a poet and you've invested a lot of your life in something you really care about. And it's uh, your passion. It's been passed down to you, perhaps from your father or, or people in your family, and you've cultivated it. And it's very important to have. And the sort of uh, point I'm making here is for all, all listeners and anyone who, who gets an opportunity to listen to this, I think it's very important to have something in your life that regulates you, that creates a sense of um, emotion or energy or almost a meditative form of whatever it may be. I'm a musician, so I revert to my tabla, which is the Indian drums, for those of you who don't know what it is. And that's my way of regulating. I have it in my office, in fact. So I finish this and I think I've got to go jam for 15 minutes. And then I have my jam and, and it's really, really given me that sense of balance and peace. Um, how has how has that helped you um, in really difficult times? I don't mean um, I don't mean it's your it's your sort of um, uh, walking stick in any way. I just mean how has being a poet has that form or that personal aspect of your life helped you to regulate, helped you to stay cool and calm and relaxed. Uh, and to what extent, and, and what would you say to other people who, who have some gifts and talents, but sometimes you get so busy in life, you're like, well, I'm not getting paid for that stuff. I've got to focus on the things that are paying the bills or paying, paying, you know, putting food on the table. So I just want to close off with your relationship with poetry, your relationship with that side of your life um, as, a, as a form of inspiration for listeners. And, um, and I'll, then I'll pass it on to Rick to wrap things up. Well, I, I don't think of poetry in that way. I mean, I think of... I think of poetry as, for me, as a means of observation and description. So if I'm in a meeting or if I'm in some activity of some kind, uh, on one level I'm participating in that activity, but on another level, it's almost like I have a camera where I'm taking a picture. And when you take a picture, you have a different entity created and then you're seeing with your eyes the same way uh, I, I may be observing things at a different level. So I may be in a meeting at two different levels. One is the business level and mm. the other is watching level. Mm. Uh, and that is interesting. It doesn't always happen, by the way. But when it happens, for me, it could lead to a, a poem. Uh, and, and a poem at the end of the day is a work of craft. You get the idea, then you put it together and you work on it. Mm. And... Uh, create something that has some form and hopefully conveys, uh, conveys some, some sense that, may, that appeals to the reader. It's not just oneself. I mean, the reader has to find, some, find himself or herself in the poem. If you do that, then I think, then I, think mm -hmm. I, I would have succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe in the idea of writing poetry for myself. Uh, I really believe in the idea of poetry that can be related to by more people than myself. Mm -hmm. That is my view. So the I, plain I truth. Know. The plain truth, say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so my view, I, I don't really think of it as a way of regulating. To come yeah. back to your question, regulating what I do. It's just something else that I do. Sometimes it plays with what I do. Sometimes it doesn't. Mm. Wonderful. So, so Arun, as we're re we have about five more minutes left or so, let's make some poetry right now. And what I mean by that is I want uh, to look at those two levels of viewing that you were just speaking of uh, in this moment. Let's pretend we're in the conference room of life on the planet Earth. And so here's what I'd like to ask you about is, number one, what are the ways that we can leverage and, and benefit from the situations right now with all the adversity in the space on the ground level? Of what you're from all the patterns and trends that you're seeing out there, um, how are, what are ways that other people listening to this show right now that we can benefit in the coming year or two, um, given the challenges? And then the second part is on that higher level, 
I know you have a lot of hope and optimism. What do you see in this coming year or two or even beyond? Um, I'd love to hear just a little bit of how you read things out. The first thing I feel that this is a time when I know we're all in this together. It may sound like a trite or like a cliche, but it's a fact. Mm -hmm. The fact that in all of humanity, rich and poor, you know, whether people or countries, we all are facing a common, uh, we're on a siege by this Mm -hmm. situation. So in a way, I hope it comes to us having more empathy for for each other, mm. coming together. And in fact, you know, when I was thinking about today, I thought the, there's a poem that John Don John Donne wrote 400 years ago, which captures it very well. That no man is an island. Mm. Right? It leaves about, and it finally ends by saying, "For whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee." So, it's, it, so this, you know, this predicament that we're in is a common predicament. For everybody. So I hope that um, you know we feel that about each other as human beings mm-hmm. and humanity as a whole. So that would be the good thing that can come out of this. But there is a, a lot more caring mm-hmm. that occurs from this, and there's a lot more unity that occurs from this. Uh, in that poem, you know, it also says, No man is an island entire of itself, that you're part of the main. So we're all part of one. I think that's, if we can come to that consciousness, uh, that would be great. I think it's, it's an opportunity for for global leaders to bring about that consciousness. Unfortunately, that is not happening. This is the time for them to all get together and say, how are we going to lift humanity out of this together? Mm. And that, that is an opportunity that is just being missed totally. And of course, we can guess where that miss is coming from, where the natural leadership should have come from, and it's not coming. So that is one. But going back to the more mundane, like what's going to happen, I think we have to work our way through this. So I was talking to some senior colleagues in the U.S. just a couple of hours ago, uh, and they were saying that some of the largest banks in the U.S. are saying that they don't see this changing much through the end of this year, through December. They don't see people just getting back to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some others are saying maybe it's not December, maybe it's February. Uh, We all know we have to wait for a vaccine or some very solid therapy cure that can help uh, reverse this. Mm-hmm. And various predictions of when a vaccine will come all the way from as early as November through the middle of next year or end of next year. Mm-hmm. Again, it's completely stochastic. We don't really know mm-hmm. that vaccines will work consistently. So we have to wait and see. But my guess is we've got to be, we've got to hunker down for at least the rest of this year, maybe part of next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and work, work for it. And so just to wrap up that thought is what an opportunity to get more connected to our passions, what's meaningful, the art that we wield out in the world or even in our homes, whether it's music or poetry or um, connecting with friends that uh, we haven't spoken with in a while. Um, just really those, those simple pleasures that really bring us more life. Mm. And what an opportunity to get to tap into that when we don't have the same old busyness distractions of travel and all the things that we did before. Uh, there's wisdom in stillness. Mm, that's right. Yet, are we practicing our stillness? That's still for me a challenge. Is even though I'm alone and I, I have that opportunity, do I actually allow myself to even get still and not distracted by the internet of things and all kinds of stuff? So, um, really appreciate. Rick, I, yeah, Rick, I want to say one thing, mate. It's yeah. very important. My nephew asked me a question the other day. He was saying something and he said, so what's this? So uncle is saying, so this AI stuff that you're doing, he said, what's the difference between AI and human beings? What's in one word? So I thought, that's a good question, really, in one word. I said, okay, love. And he said, mm-hmm. ah, okay. I said, that's it, buddy, love. <laughs> so, uh, and he, I said, we can love, they can't as yet. <laughs> So, you know, that's, I think that's the, the best way of uh, conveying that. But um, mm. um, what, what a wonderful session today, right, Rick, with uh, Arun. And Arun, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. You've been uh, absolutely fantastic. What a poignant and profound um, dialogue and uh, things for us to think about. And I like the, the last bit in particular around mm. the sense of caring and togetherness. And together we have to take humanity out of this situation or pull us out of this tough situation. It's like someone giving you a hand and pulling you out. Um, we have, we've got to learn from that, I think, all of us. And um, uh, so, Rick, over to you. Close it off, man. 
Yeah, I want to thank you also, Arun, um, for your generosity of time and a lot of your wisdom you you were sharing throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. And it's just so great to see you know leaders of major organizations that have this kind of your your mentality. You know that you're representing a lot of uh, what the world needs more of, in my opinion, in terms of leadership and the care for for humanity. So thank you for all that you bring and do, and for being on our show today. Thank um, you. I hope, and then I also just want to make a quick uh, announcement for our, our next week. Um, here we go. Is we're going to be going live same time, same channel next week. We're going to be talking to Suresh uh, from the. He's the COO of TSB Bank on how to lead courageous conversations that compel action. And this man is very knowledgeable in that area. So tune in next week. Thank you again. And uh, lastly, Arun, how can people find out about you if they want to learn more about your work? what you're up to today, where's the best place to, to find out about you? Well, I have a, a, a website, arunmkumar.com, which has uh, a number of my writings and, uh, and, and uh, talks, etc. So arunmkumar.com. Okay, or, or, or your LinkedIn page will also give some good information. Yeah, okay, yeah, excellent. Google. <laughs> or, or Google. <laughs> For those of you who, who haven't heard of Google, go out there and do that. Um, but thank you again so much. And do you have any final words for our audience before we depart today? No, I'd say, Rick and I, it's a really great, uh, great chat with you. I really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you for having me. Namaste, namaskar. Namaste. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.